Okay, I think we're live. Hi everyone, um, this is our Science Sunday Hangout with Joan Hiller, um, who's an electron microscopist at the Argon National Laboratories. And joining me is my co-host, um, Scott Lewis from Cosmoplex. Hi everyone. And I'll let John introduce himself um, and tell us about what he does. Well, first I'd like to thank Budidi and Scott for hosting this Science Sunday Hangout on air. Um, I am an electron microscopist at Argonne National Laboratory, just located outside Chicago, Illinois. And I am part of the Nanoscience and Technology Division here at Argonne. And we do materials characterization of, of various different types of materials using uh, various types of electron microscopy. And today I'm here to answer your questions and talk to you about one of the areas of electron microscopy, which is scanning electron microscopy. So thanks for uh, hosting this, you two. Yeah, not a problem. It's, it's yeah. great that we're trying to find different ways of bringing some amazing science and technology out to the public that most people wouldn't have access to. So it's, it's really great that, that you're able to bring us into your lab and show us uh, show us things very, very close up that I know I don't get the opportunity to see. I typically do with telescopes and looking at the very large. So being able to yeah. take a look at the, the contrasting extremely small, I find it to be extremely fascinating. And I think this is the first time we're actually live streaming an electron microscope across the world like this. And I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. So as, as Benina was mentioning earlier, um, we will be answering any comments coming through here. So you can leave your comments or questions on the event page. Also on any of the shared, um, any of the shared posts on Google Plus as well, we'll be able to check those comments. We'll be using the hashtag on Twitter, HOA. And also if you're watching us on YouTube, you can leave comments in there too. And we'll be able to see any of those comments coming through. And we'll, uh, John will be able to see them as well, and we'll post some of those to him if you have any requests for when we are doing our live imaging on uh, see if we can get some, um, some live science going on from the public going on here. And hopefully we won't have any technical issues. I, I think, you know, with our dry runs, we've been doing really good. Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy with it. So I, I'm really yeah. excited for, uh, for everyone going out. So, um, John, real quick, I, I wanted to ask you, it's something that Boudini and I have been... Um, have really asked all of our guests for all of our hangouts that we've done, what got you into your specific field or science in general? Uh, yeah, so um, I came about uh, becoming an electron microscopist in a very odd way. Um, I actually started out uh, as an undergrad in biology and I volunteered over one of the summers uh, to work at a wildlife health care facility uh, that uh, studied f uh, different diseases of wildlife. Uh, you know, the two-headed frogs, the two-headed snakes, and different various parasitics and, and viral uh, diseases that run rapid through the wildlife populations. And I wanted to be a wildlife pathologist, and so doing this uh, volunteer work, I, I had to take histological tissue samples and go over to the university and give them to a biological electron microscopist and, uh, and analyze these tissue samples. And I found out uh, what electron microscopes were and how they operated. And I thought that, wow, this is just really, really cool uh, to see things uh, at this small a level. Yeah. And, and, and finding out a little bit more uh, about the work that there was going on at the university, I found that, you know, there's a lot going on in materials characterization, so non-biologicals. Uh, and I became very interested in that. And so I totally switched my majors around and uh, decided to get into uh, material science and engineering. And that then led me down the road of focusing in on not synthesizing materials, but characterizing them. And that has put me here at Argonne characterizing different types of new materials for energy research uh, since 1999. And that's how I got brought into the world of 
electron microscopy. I specialize in materials research, so that I don't I don't look at any biological samples. At least right. you know, we look at polymers and things like that, but not biologicals. And so was it a little weird going over since you started off in biology? To you miss the biology. <laughs> I always miss the biology. However, uh, you miss the squishy it, science. Is, is that hey, hey. Biology <laughs> is so very chaotic of systems to study. You know, materials they have diffraction patterns and known crystal orientations. Uh, biological systems are so complex that uh, they're they're chaotic yeah. in a way. And so I do I I do miss the biological side of things. Uh, it's a very interesting field. Uh, but I do love my materials work that I do here because a lot of the work that we do here is to make different types of materials uh, for energy research, battery, different battery technologies. Uh, some of our work actually is is situated inside the Chevy Volt battery. That's that's okay. out. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I remember one of the things you mentioned was that you were involved in. Um, creating an artificial retina. So clearly your, your work does have, you know, it crosses over to biology even now. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, that was a project that was sponsored by the Department of Energy. And okay. uh, it was an ongoing project uh, that was actually going on when I first got here. And I uh, was very interested in it. And it, it encompassed uh, I believe five different national laboratories, uh, okay. some different uh, industrial partners, and so there were uh, over a hundred different research scientists involved in developing this and getting the product out. Uh, my side was the characterization of something called UNCD, which stands for Ultra Nano Crystalline Diamond, and so these little bits of diamond are smaller than two nanometer grain sizes. Okay. And, uh, and it's basically a process where you can coat something, whatever that may be, with a very thin film of this UNCD. And diamond being carbon-based, uh, your body will not reject it. Right. The the small size of the diamonds, when things become very small on the nanoscale, we find that they act differently, uh, and this happens to have a tribological effect, uh, a, a friction study. So it has a very very uh, low friction, uh, almost near zero, and it's also a very hard substance. It's 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 diamond. Yeah. And so if you think about that, um, your retina is a pretty amazing biological system in itself with your eyelids rubbing over and over. It's, it has salinity involved in it. And most materials will eventually, if you want to make an artificial retina, you have to take into account the salinity, the yeah. friction and wear of, of, the, uh, of your eyelid over, your, over the, the retina. And you know how long is it going to last, and will the body accept it? And yeah. this film uh, actually was developed for other purposes, and fell into being a perfect candidate for doing the artificial retina. Right. Uh, so right now we're we're working with other industrial partners to coat the insides of the moving parts of diesel engines, and uh, have them running without any oil. So, wow. if we can get you know diesel engines coated and uh, working like this, we can save a lot of a lot of carbon and oil. Oh, absolutely! I mean, that's that's a big part of you know energy efficiency. It's just the whole friction component yeah. in, in anything going on. So you when you're having any sort of force acting against you, you're having to exert more just to overcome it. So if we can find a way to to lower that friction coefficient to near zero, that, that's amazing. Yeah. Yes. It, it, and it's, it's amazing you go from retina to, you know, saving the planet, like <laughs> cutting out oil usage. You know? We're trying. It, it, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's different. Are you Superman, in, John? Yeah, no, no. 
<laughs> it's different working in R&D and then taking something that you fabricate and make here in a lab yeah. and move that over to to industry. You know, yeah. it has to be cost effective to do it. Yeah. And so that was one of the hurdles that we had to jump through uh, and working with other industrial partners and in doing and doing that, you know, talking to their engineers and 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 saying, "Okay, well what what do you need to be done?" Yeah. And so now it's actually approved, I believe, a month and a half or something like that ago from the FDA. It's the artificial retina has actually been implanted and used for, I believe, two and a half years in Europe. Oh, wow. It's just because of the reg medical regulations in the United States that we had to have FDA approval for it. Right. right. That's... that's Got to, you know, having your hand in something like that, I think, I, I couldn't even imagine it's just the, the fact that you're literally going to be touching lives from your research that you've done using an electron microscope and think you could actually be in, impacting people's vision for years and decades to come. I think that's fascinating. And that's some really amazing work, plus any of the future um, usage from your research, too. I think that's really a, a wonderful way of showing how the different sciences being performed, even if you are in a, you know, an electron microscopist in a lab, people don't typically think you're going to be impacting human beings in their daily lives, but if yeah. you're doing something out there, it really connects to us and helping us, you know, find new uh, medical breakthroughs and, you know, something as as intrinsic as, as seeing. That's it's mm -hmm. amazing. It's bringing someone's visions back or improving it that much. Yeah, and so if I can elaborate a little bit more on this UNCD, Sure. Um, th there's all types of possibilities. Like I said, the, the artificial retina, and then we have, uh, you know, coating internal wearing parts of, of, of diesel engines. But we're also trying to, you know, take this into the future a, a, a bit. And you know that that movie from the 1960s where they injected the little spaceship into the bloodstream, and I. I I, I've lost the name of the movie. Fantastic Voyage, I think. Right, I think so. Right? I think that's it. Yeah. And so you know, th there's there's talk of having little little micro robots that you can inject into the bloodstream and go scrape all the plaque away from arteries and such. Well, these things need to be wear resistant as well and be accepted by the body. So if we could use this coating to uh, to coat these miniature robots that do their job. Uh, of cutting the plaque in arteries down, this is the perfect candidate for doing something like that. You know, the body will accept it, and it, and it yeah. will last for a, a, a long time. Yeah. And that's, again, another amazing application, because so far, gift of sight, heart disease, and fossil fuels. Yeah. Anything <laughs> else you've got cooking? Did you save babies on the weekend, or? You know? <laughs> well, you know, there's these. The, I, I'd like to talk about these these devices, these little robots. We call them uh, MEMS devices, micro electrical yeah. mechanical systems, right. and uh, they're mainly made out of silicon-based materials, which are brittle and, and and don't wear very well and have a very short life span. Um, we're actually looking at coding these uh, devices to, to, uh, to last longer. Um, that's, that's, you know, whatever else the engineers can think of. And my, my job was to characterize, you know, this, this, these thin films. They weren't, they, you know, and when we do go through materials characterization, uh, the first thing that you want to do is you want to look at it with your eye. What, what does it look like? And then you take it to an optical microscope, and you, you get some optical micrographs of what it looks like. If you can't answer your question with a simple thing like that, then you take it to the next level, which is electron microscopy. And we start off very simple using what I'm going to talk about today is scanning electron microscopy, which is uh, a lot easier to prepare the samples. And for a future hangout, we'll, we'll discuss uh, the dark side. Transmission electron microscopy. The dark side of electron microscopy. Yeah. 
Well, you, you mentioned earlier um, when you were learning, and I, I know I'm not all too familiar with electron microscopy and how it works. Could you give a, a, a general idea of what we're doing when we're imaging with, elect, with an electron microscope? I know it's, it's got to be a little bit different than pulling out your camera phone and just getting really, having a really good zoom lens. So could you kind of elaborate, on, at least in general terms, on what's happening there? So, yes. Um, the electron microscope, uh, basically, uh, I'm going to move off to the side here and show you what one looks like back here. Okay, there is a, a typical scanning electron microscope. Okay, and so what happens is, is uh, just like uh, an optical microscope uses light, uh, the light interacts with the sample and, and you see a magnified image of it. Uh, however, the, the, the wavelength of, of light is, is so large that you can't resolve smaller things that are, you know, the most you can get out of an optical microscope is 1,000 times magnification. Okay? Okay. And so by using electrons, electrons have a very, very um, small wavelength, which allows them to penetrate into a sample and see or resolve uh, things much better than an optical microscope. So how do we do that? I mean, an optical microscope, like everybody knows, has lenses. And so does an electron microscope. But it's not a typical lens in, in, in like, a, like glasses of a lens. We use electromagnetic lenses. Okay, so first we have to get the electrons out and what we do is we have a uh, what we call an electron source and there are different types uh, this one here is a field emitting uh, gun and so we generate electrons and these electrons are sucked off of a very sharp tungsten needle after a, a current is passed through it and the electrons travel down a, a, a column. Let me move out of the way again. They come down a, uh, a, a oh, this reverse mirror thing is goofy. Anyway, they come down the column of the microscope and get steered basically with electromagnetic uh, lenses. And so electrons are negatively charged. Therefore, we can uh, apply positive or negative if we want to attract them or repel them and steer them down towards the sample surface. And using a multitude of different lenses uh, and focusing lenses, uh, we can steer the electrons down to the sample surface. And once we do that, uh, typical, you know, you can focus a, a scanning electron microscope beam down to, you know, uh, around two or three nanometers. You can get even better than that, but I'm just going to about two or three nanometer probe size. And so when that electron beam interacts with the sample, there are multiple things, multiple things happen. Um, one electron uh, will interact with the sample, uh, an atom on the surface of the sample. And uh, the atom on the sample can uh, reject its electron. Those are called secondary electrons. And so it is representative of the sample. Uh, and each atom of the sample has electrons that float around, and we can detect those using different types of detectors and, uh, and, and, and different processing of that signal, which relates to an image. So, so basically, uh, we are detecting electrons from the sample, which are secondary electrons. Uh, another thing that happens when the when the electron beam hits a sample is it could the electron that we generate could be bounced back backwards and those are called backscatter electrons so you're literally and, shooting electrons at atoms and yes hitting and it's possible hitting the other electrons themselves and bouncing them back yes so we can detect the electrons that originate from the sample Mm -hmm. uh, or these backscattered electrons are, are, are electrons that have interacted with the, the, the sample and have bounced back upwards, and they're called backscatter. 
And so there's a, a loss of energy of these electrons. Right. And we can then um, measure that, 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 that loss. And those are backscattered uh, electrons. And they basically contain elemental information. Uh, on, uh, if you look at a periodic table, right. you, uh, you know, atomic numbers of things. And each uh, element exhibits a different contrast mechanism depending upon what their, their atomic number is. And the last thing I'd like to mention about what happens when, when it interacts with the, uh, the sample is something that we, it's a very powerful tool. Um, you also emit x-rays. Uh, so depending upon the, the voltage that you use in, in our microscope here, mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can pull out very detailed elemental uh, information from the sample. So not only do you get an image uh, and can see what your sample looks like, uh, you also can get elemental information from it. And so you can either get a spectrum that uh, each element has a signature, um, different types of signature uh, X-ray uh, points, and right. and these spectrum we can then tell how wh wh how much carbon or how much platinum or how much gold is is in a sample, and we can tell where it is as well. Oh, that's so, awesome! So you're doing some uh, like spectroscopy. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're called elemental maps, and instead of getting a, a grayscale image of what you're looking at, you get an elemental image, and it tells you exactly where the elements are dispersed in, in where you're scanning the sample. Wow, that's really cool. Um, if you're fabricating something, you know, you're making something, and you really don't know where, like uh, a lithium-ion battery, well, where did the lithium go? Right. right. And did it did it migrate from from point A or point B to, to where did it go, uh, and and why did it uh, is it not working anymore? We can then you know set the microscope parameters up and tune it up to detect lithium, uh, the signature peaks of lithium, and find out where it is. Now, uh, I, I use lithium as an example, but that's a, that's a bad example. But you know <laughs> you know what I you know what I mean with right. that. Um, so, you know, if you're fabricating some type of material, you can figure out where these elements are dispersed. No, it's really awesome. I just think about the different implications and different ways that this technology is used. And it's something, you know, how, how long has electron microscopy been around that we've been using it? So, yeah, I mean, it's, an old, it's, a, it's fairly old. So the first electron microscopes were built in Germany in the 1930s, I believe. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. Uh, the scanning electron microscope, like this one here, uh, is has been around for since the 60s. Okay. And it, it, they've been around for a while, but they they just keep being improved upon. You right. know, um, the resolution of these microscopes just keeps getting better and better and better. Back in the day, you know, we didn't have computers to control them. Uh, we had cathode ray tubes and you know, photographic plates for taking pictures. Now, uh, you just click a button and you have a click a button. You go play Angry Birds, come back, yeah. and, and you're done. You have a picture, you know. Right. Um, well, That's essentially what um, I do with the confocal microscope stuff. We do. We just set the plate, click. It's an hour's run. Go get dinner sorted. <laughs> so. Yeah. The rough life of a scientist, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love my work. I enjoy it. Well, it's, it's, it comes across very clearly that you do. Well, I, I wanted to show, since you're talking about imaging, and now that with this new technology and being able to resolve, over here on the other, um, on the Science Sunday window, we're, yeah. we're looking at something here on your camera eight. Can you describe what we're looking at and what scale we're looking at? Are we talking about the device? Yeah, yeah. So on yeah. Um, what we're imaging right now. Okay, uh, that is a MEMS device of a uh, a, a tensile strainer, and so uh, if I move over to the microscope, uh, which I'll do in a little bit, uh, you you will see a little space in between these little pinchers, 
And basically, you put your sample. So for this, I'll give an example of a carbon nanotube. You put your carbon nanotube across this bridge, and it will basically pull uh, the nanotube apart. And we can then measure uh, the force that it takes for it to, to fracture. And you know, so you have to design the device uh, to even perform the experiment. You know, it's like taking a piece of your hair and pulling it with your fingers, but you can't do that with carbon nanotubes. <laughs> right. So, um, you want me to move over? And, uh, yeah, let's take sure. a look and see but, what's going on there. Do you, and, and what size are we looking at right now? So how how magnified are we at? And I know that we can go in a little bit more too, and I know that okay. you're looking at it. Let me take a look at what we have here. Okay, so. If you look at, I'm going to go into low magnification mode here, and if you look at this device, there are a multitude of, I'll call them springs, on the bottom and the top side. There's a few hundred of them. And when there's a, a voltage applied to them, they will actuate. Uh, and depending upon the voltage, depends upon how much you uh, pull, how much force you exert. And so these springs all work in unison. It was, it was designed at Northwestern University. And if I can move here. Wow. That, that if you is move awesome. In here, <laughs> across that bridge is where you would put your sample. Now, I'm going to refresh. Um, OK, my length scale, my, my micron marker is not right. The, okay. the, the width of that bridge from, from left to right is about um, 8 microns. Wow. Wow. Okay, I think it just refreshed over here uh, uh, that everybody can see it. So this is one of the things. So if we can uh, get our sample across this micro bridge and uh, apply a voltage, we can then watch and see when our sample will fracture. Right. And, and to let people know, a micron is one one millionth of a meter. Yes. If you, if you split Very. a meter stick into one million slices, and you said eight of those? Yes. yes. That's, eight of them. that's amazing. So it's, pr it's a pretty small little device. And then this little guy on the left-hand side uh, is connected underneath and, and, and does some other types of measurements on, on when it fractures and, and sometimes catches it. So, What's the other the, stuff on that image? It kind of looks like debris, but is it? I'm sorry? What What's the other stuff on that image? Um, is it debris or...? That is debris, yes. Okay. Yes. So do you have to clean it before using or...? Uh, we. we how does maintenance work for something? How did, how did we level? make this device, you mean? Maintenance. Like, how do you keep things clean there at that level um, when a dust particle is like a football? It's because uh, we have taken it out of its clean room environment and just putting it ah. over here, we've okay. contaminated it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you, you don't want those things on there. That's, they're yeah. not good because they add you know, some mass to it. Right. Yeah. Your, it affects your measurements, yes. Okay. So is there anything you do to maintain it, to bring it back to a sterile condition? This, no. Once it's contaminated, it's, it's, it's no longer a, a, a device that uh, we can use. Right. Okay. So I hope you just... didn't sacrifice it just for us. No, I hope you did. I feel important if you did. <laughs> so <laughs> so there, you know, there's, mo there's more cool stuff that I have here. I can't... You know, I asked people what they wanted to see, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, I think one person said they wanted to see what the film, uh, a tungsten, and I said, well, uh, you know, tungsten is pretty boring to look at, but we can always <laughs> look at a, at a filament. Yeah. So I can, uh, let's see here. All right, so that image should be 
moving around a little bit to our next location. Okay. Wow. Okay. So there's uh, that's what the filament of a light bulb looks like. That is awesome. Oh wow! All right, and uh, if we go into high magnification mode here, you know. Oh wow! That eventually, is you know, if you wanted, if you, if you were General Electric and you wondered why your tungsten filaments kept blowing, you could then do some failure analysis work on this. <laughs> right. And, and go in and say, well, why did it fracture here? Is our tungsten not pure enough, or are there impurities, or whatever? And so you can then, you know, move into where the area was fractured. And that is amazing. And take a look at that. And, and, and what scale are we at now? Looking at this so, filament yeah, of a light bulb? I'm having, I'm having an issue with the refresh of my, uh, my micron marker here. Okay. So let me, uh, so those tick marks at the bottom there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's 36.6 microns. Okay, so I, see, I okay. see the number, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so if you put your finger up there, you know, so the, the, the width of that filament from top to bottom is just a little bit less than 35 microns. Right. That is crazy. So 35 millionths of a meter, that's... Yeah. And so and this is the tungsten there. So we're looking, so you can actually see, is that just some, um, some manufacturer defects on that, or is that just dust? That, you know, when we're at this level of magnification, it's very difficult to get something that's got a pure surface to it. Right. Uh, this actually came from a light bulb in my house that <laughs> actually operated very well until I broke it. Um, <laughs> probably has some some residue of something from inside the light bulb in it. Right. Now I'm going to hear it from everybody why I'm a energy person and I have incandescent light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> well, to well, you sacrifice it, it for you science. It. And yeah. going to All in the name efficiency. of science. Yes. Right. For and I'm sure well, you'll replace it with an energy saver next. I promise I replace this 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 light bulb with a, a fluorescent one. Or oh, CCFL. <laughs> okay. That, so that's awesome. Um, I think what I'd like to do next is is show you the real capability of of the, this microscope and go into uh, into the nano world a little bit and and do some imaging on some very small stuff. Yeah, that'd sure. be great. Um, You'll still see the side of my head, but I'm going to have to concentrate uh, a little bit to tune things up a little bit. Oh, it's okay. That's we'll okay. be staring at the at the output images, so don't worry about right. that. Here we go. <laughs> okay, it's still moving around. And so, just to give you an idea of what the sample is. It's um, it's a very s simple sample. It's gold on carbon, and it is okay. what uh, us microscopists use as a resolution standard. So we actually use this sample to test the ultimate resolution of the microscope. Gotcha. Okay. And I'm going to zoom out here. Uh, let me refresh this background image. And so we see some flakes of dust, okay? 100 microns. So 100 microns is typically the thickness of, of a human hair. Right. Okay? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to be watching the refresh here. So I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to stop here. Okay, so we see some things here. Right. Um, and I'm going to refresh the backdrop again. So now we're at um, 8 microns. That entire length of that bar is uh, 8 microns. So now we're going to move in a little bit more.
Wow. And all of these little guys here, I'm going to do another refresh on the background. So we should have about, what does that say, 957 nanometers? Yeah. Okay. So each one of these <laughs> islands are, are individual grains of gold. Wow. Oh, my God. Maybe that would be a little clear for you. It's clear on my end, but not on the on the image on the mo on the monitor here. Yeah, it's getting a little fuzzy. Something. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I think oh, this is. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Go further. That's crazy. <laughs> that is insane. So and this look is at the, the first time we are seeing this as well. So yeah, I hope the people watching this can share our excitement at seeing it at this level. Yeah, Jonathan Lingle just, just commented, it's like, this is like so cool. I would spend all week playing with something like that. I, I wouldn't yeah. leave either. I would just be looking at as yeah. much stuff as I could <laughs> at such a tiny level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so those each one of those grains is probably, you know, uh, 100 or so nanometers, but you can see there's even smaller ones in between there. Yeah. Now, I... I Believe me when I tell you we can even go on higher magnification. The magnification right now is 90,000 times. Okay? Oh, so uh, the problem that we have here is that every time I talk, the vibration from me speaking is affecting the resolution of the microscope. That uh, is crazy. So, so just so just the your sound, the, the sound coming out of your mouth and the on the air itself. Yes, I'm in a very well controlled room. The mm -hmm. so to give you an idea about that, the temperature does not fluctuate a tenth of a degree in this room. Uh, we have full vi vibration isolation uh, in the in the foundation. Uh, I have we have acoustic panels. I don't know if you saw them behind. Yeah, I saw them in the background. Yeah. To control the acoustics, uh, and just by my talking, it's affecting the the image here. We'll stop uh, talking and go deeper. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now this is phenomenal, John. So yeah, it, um, but there, you know, we're there's other other things that I wanted to show you, um, but I we're running out of time on this microscope. I think. Okay. Um, we can run a little bit over if everyone's okay with it. We've done it before, so. Yeah, as long so as security always, doesn't come in and kick you out. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's that just shows the the, the resolution of what uh, a scanning electron microscope can do. Um, let me go to something. I told you I don't do biologicals, but I I tried. Right. <laughs> I tried. Thirteen point one. All right, let's see if anybody can figure out. Um, that is. This is where you always see the cute uh, electron micrographs on the internet that are colored all kinds of funny uh -huh. ways. Such like that. Is that a fly? That is a fly. Wow. Uh, that is a fly, and those are flies' eyes. Oh my god. That and is so cool. So, um, so what's what it like to, to prepare samples, like biological samples? So that's biological, sorry, go yeah, on. biological samples are a pain um, <laughs> because th this is electron microscopy. So we use electrons, which are negatively charged, and you your sample has to be conductive to to ground. You know, the the electrons have to get to Earth somehow to ground, and most biological systems, you know, are are very good insulators, right. and they don't conduct, and so therefore we cannot image them. We have to prepare them in special ways. And I am by no means an expert in biological sample prep for for EM microscopy, but uh, 
what I did with this one is I put it into an instrument and, and put a very, very, like, 10 nanometer coating of gold over the top of it. And basically, it's so thin that it conformed to all of the morphology of the, the, of the fly that it allows the electrons to go to, to ground. And if I zoom in high enough, uh, you probably will see little gold pieces like we saw on the last sample that we were on. And so you just have to make sure that the sample conducts. There are other types of electron microscopes that we will actually see uh, from the meteor. Um, right. it's, it's an environmental uh, microscope. And what that does is it allows us to put in water vapor to dissipate uh, the charging, the, the, the non-grounding of, of the sample. Uh, but it, it, it's at a cost that we lose uh, resolution because the electrons are basically hitting um, water molecules and, and stuff. You know, I, I forgot to mention that these microscopes are all under high vacuum, higher vacuum than space. So you, it, it's because the electrons have to travel uh, a distance without hitting anything. Right, uh, right. Right? So in environmental microscopes, we, we introduce a water vapor. And of course, uh, the more water vapor you put in, the, the, you lose resolution in the microscope because the electrons are, 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 are hitting other things and not your sample. What do I, you mean a higher vacuum than space? Because isn't space already a vacuum? Yes, but the, if you measured the, uh, the, the vacuum, what I meant by that is the vacuum of space is dirtier than the vacuum of our electron microscopes. Right, because okay. there's cosmic, there's just, there's just stuff out yeah. in space. Okay. Even, even though it looks like, you know, it's just fast and empty and there's just pockets of stuff. Even though it's a vacuum, right. Right. Okay. There's, there's so this, that's what there's a stuff. dirty vacuum is. <laughs> yes, space is the dirty vacuum of the universe. And okay. <laughs> yeah. So our, our, our microscopes are kept under uh, a very, very high vacuum. And... Uh, it's just to. It also reduces contamination. Uh, so when you when you image your samples and an electron beam interacts with the sample, you you contaminate it with carbon deposits uh, from dirtiness of vacuum. And the better the vacuum, uh, the better the the image quality. Right. I, I'm I'm still just blown away. I mean, we're looking at the the compound eye of a fly. That, um, as Rajni yeah. pointed out, the Amatidia, I believe, is what it's called, and just the the shape and how you can see the patterns, the way that's just assembled on such something so small as the compound eye of an insect, it just blows me away. And so this, yeah, this is this is a wing. Wow. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. So those are, uh, I get a little bit refresh here. These are individual yeah. hairs that are coming off of the, uh, uh, off of the wing. <laughs> that wow. Yeah, seriously. No. I, yeah, I'm, I'm speechless, and I'm never yeah, speechless. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that's, that's, this is yeah, you're so never speechless. Amazing. <laughs> we really don't do much biological work here, but we do have some colleagues from the FDA okay. uh, that are, are using our environmental microscope to study the, the big salmonella breakout uh, that happened a few years ago. Okay. Uh, and they have to use that microscope uh, because... It's a biological, you know. Right. Yeah. And they don't want to coat it in gold because it it it, it's, it it changes the morphology of their samples, basically. Right. Okay. So. No, that's um, this is awesome. But I wanted yeah. to I wanted to touch on something pretty pretty cool. Um, so we we have a an electron microscope and it scans and we get these great images and. We can see things that are really cool, but you know, one of the things that I do here uh, also is is modify and design 
different things that don't exist everywhere. And okay. so these things have been commercially available for a while. However, we've modified some of the, the some of the commercial things. If you build here. a TARDIS, if you built a TARDIS, I will be completely yeah. jealous. <laughs> and so imagine if you now take another column, uh, what I'm calling a column, another uh, another imaging device, and you and you slap it on the side of one of these microscopes here. But instead of throwing electrons down, let's let's throw a big gallium ion down, a positively charged big bowling ball, and and steer it. But we have to steer it with lenses. But because um, it's a positively charged ion, we and don't use electromagnetic lenses, we'll use electrostatic lenses. Okay. okay, all right. And so this big bowling ball, so think of your sample as a bunch of pool balls that are all racked together, and the white cue ball is the big gallium ion, and it goes flying into the, uh, the, the rack of pool balls and smacks all of these atoms away, and they get sucked up into vacuum. Uh, Basically, it's it's a focused ion beam, so you focus ions now instead of electrons, and you can selectively remove material in your sample now, because you're now sputtering, uh, the physical process of sputtering right. uh, away in select areas, and so I'd like to um, I have a video. This this microscope is not online. Okay. And so I have a movie created that I'd like to screen share and show you an idea of what we can do with it. Okay. Oh, yeah, that would be great, John. Thanks. So let me show you what this does. And so with very complex scanning techniques, you can control the ion beam uh, very quickly because it's controlled through electrostatic lenses. And it's a, it's a very, very powerful tool. And let me show you a video of it. I'll keep my microphone on and talk about it. Um, can you see this? Yeah. Yes. What okay. is that? So that is that micron marker on the left is one micron. This is UNCD film, the ultra nano crystalline diamond film, and I'm making a little pillar. Now you'll see a seed layer of tungsten come up, and then <laughs> silicon. Okay, so I am removing, like, you know, like a potter on a potting wheel. You know. Yeah. I'm, but I'm <laughs> using the ion. I'm using the ion beam, to. Uh, to remove it. I'll play it again for you. And so I'm selectively targeting a very small area that's one micron. And I want to make a, a little point out of it because I want to yeah. study that. And so you see the, the removal of the diamond, the ion beam, and then the tungsten seed layer underneath it, and then a silicon substrate. So what this allows us to do is find a you know a very specific site specific area uh, in your sample and be able to characterize that very small area of interest. Is it going very slow for you? Yeah, but I I'm I'm enjoying it actually. <laughs> I'm loving the way that it's you know circularly just coming in and removing layer after layer after layer. There we go. Maybe that's better. So we're using a, a, a vector scanning system that can scan in circles. And yeah. so it basically, you know, I can control it. Right now it's scanning from the outer diameter to the inner diameter. We can reverse it if we wanted to. Yeah. It's all done through, through computers. Um, I can also import CAD files, very complicated CAD files into this, and be able to draw. Uh, whatever I wanted to, and have it uh, remove that material. So, like reverse three D printing, kind of. Right. Is that 3D how you erasing? get those? Is that how you get those smiley faces drawn on 
things at a nano level? Yes. Um, right, okay. Mm -hmm. And so okay. What, what I was doing there was making a, 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 a point for something called atom probe analysis. And it's a totally different type of characterization. It's not electron microscopy. But the sample preparation for this instrument is very, very complicated. Right. So you have to make a needle-like structure with a tip diameter of less than 50 nanometers. So how do you do that? You know, uh, you carefully. can do it electrochemically if you have something that can uh, electrochemically etch. But if you have something that's like diamond, that is resistant to everything, uh, you, you have to use these focused ion beams to carve out and make a very, very sharp tip to analyze it further. And taking it even one step further, now let's, let's go ahead and put a gas injection system into the same microscope and, and open up the gas valve and allow a precursor of gas to flow into the microscope, and instead We're just of going to start a new show called "Pimp My Microscope," and yeah. you can be our host. This is awesome. <laughs> and so now the ion beam, wherever you're scanning, is not removing material, but it's interacting with the gas precursor that you've introduced, and it's now going to deposit. So you can now grow structures. Right. Wherever the ion beam is scanning it's not going to remove the material because it's interacting with the gas and once it cracks the gas precursor it it, it it's an organic compound mm -hmm. and you can deposit structures so it's like embossing instead of carving exactly yeah wow. so let's say that i'm an r and d person for a big um, chip manufacturer and a chip comes off the fab line and you know what we want to modify this chip. We, we want to modify how the leads are, are, are traced out. And so you stick it in one of these guys and you cut it using the ion beam. You cut the wire, right? So you short it. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to put gas in here now, but it's going to deposit platinum. And I'm going to make a little solder joint from this part to the other part. And now you've just totally modified your device without having to go through and do uh, complex lithography and spend millions of dollars on a new mask and, and so forth and so forth. That's, that's crazy. That is awesome. And I'm going to screen share something again here. Okay. So. But wait, there's more. <laughs> wait, there's more. So, so now, um, talking about pimping your microscope, <laughs> Is that rims? <laughs> you got rims on it, don't you? So. No, it's bouncing. <laughs> yeah. It's so bouncing. now let's. So let's now take a very sharp needle, a very sharp needle, and put that into the same microscope, and use the ion beam to fabricate this device. I'm going to start it up again for you. Okay. Okay, and we fabricate this device using the ion beam, and then we have this very sharp probe tip come in, and it's controlled by piezo crystals that move with non-motors, but by applying a voltage to a crystal, you can activate this on very small levels. And so what, we're, what we were doing here is moving this device up and down, and it has a thin film of piezo crystals on it. Okay. And when you move something that has piezo uh, responsiveness like that, you can generate a current out of it as you move it up and down. Okay? You can also do it the other way by applying a current to it and it moves all by itself. Oh, awesome. Without having the tip move it. Uh, that's how these MEMS devices usually work. And so the idea that I wanted to show you is I, I didn't have a video of, of what I wanted to explain. Let me get back into here. Is So now you have uh, this very sharp probe tip that can mm -hmm. interact with the sample and move it. But let's say we, we use the ion beam. Uh, we have this very small particle of interest. You can't even see it with, the, with your human eye. You need an electron microscope to see it. Uh, and we want to move it 
for the next level of microscopy is transmission electron microscopy. So what we do is we use the ion beam to remove the material next to the, the place of interest. And then we take this probe tip and we put it next to the little particle. And then we open the gas valve and we glue it using uh, the ion beam and the gas precursor. We glue it to the probe tip and now we can pick it up. And we can now move it and put it wherever we want. Oh, so you're able to manipulate it there with... Correct. That's, wow. So you can take individual carbon nanotubes if you want and pick them up and move them from point A to point B. And with that being said, the first thing that we looked at, I told you you could put a carbon nanotube across that micro bridge. Right. That's how we do it. We, we use a very, very sharp probe tip and go in and pick a carbon nanotube up that we're interested in and then move it over to the sample that has the device fabricated with the bridge. And then we use the ion beam with the gas injector and we glue each end of the nanotube down on either side of the bridge. And then we use the ion, we shut the gas off and use the ion beam to cut the probe tip away from the sample. So it's free. So we can manipulate, uh, I mean we, we can visualize, uh, but we can also manipulate. No, that's, I, I, I never even thought about just something simple as, okay, I need to move this and hold it down. But when you're something on that small of a level, yeah, that's, I, I didn't even consider it in the way that you well, are. Yeah, when people see it actually being done, they're pretty impressed with it because it is really cool. Yeah, oh, wow. Well. Having the ability to uh, move, manipulate, fabricate things on such a small length scale mm -hmm. is, is really cool. And the, you know, the other thing that we mentioned in the, uh, the ad for the hangout here is something that I did with three-dimensional reconstruction right. and that was done using one of these scanning microscopes as well as these uh, the IM beam attachment. So um, back, when, back when I was doing this it was, uh, there was a big push for research of solid oxide fuel cells and the characterization of them and the difficult thing was uh, trying to figure out uh, the tortuosity or basically how much por porosity you have compared to other things because in a solid oxide fuel cell you need to have element A move through pores and react with element B Okay. and if it doesn't have a way to find it to get there uh, it doesn't work very well and so uh, what we decided to do is uh, pretend your sample is a loaf of bread that isn't cut okay. and we basically use the focused ion beam to cut the pieces of the slices of bread and so the ion beam would go in and make a cut and then the scanning electron microscope would take a very high resolution image of it and then you have an image and then right. the ion beam would get turned back on and make another cut and then another image. And then you can take all of the stacks of the, the slices of bread and using some post-processing uh, software put together a three-dimensional reconstruction of, of, of your sample. Wow. Right. And Making nano sandwiches? <laughs> yeah. Only, but, uh, <laughs> The, the the slice of the slice of bread is about twelve nanometers. Right. So you know, uh, over over a ten micron area, you have over a thousand images that you mm -hmm. have to deal with. And you know, the hard part is getting all of that data together and having your computer chug out the the result. Right. I mean, so now saying that the coolest thing since slice, since sliced bread, obviously now. Mm -hmm. You, you can't. That's that's so awesome. Dude, being able to slice it and being able to see how that goes down frame by frame, I, it's mind blowing. I mean, again, this technology has been around for a while. It's not new, uh, so right. I'm not talking about anything that's groundbreaking stuff. But it's the technique. It's 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 there's endless possibilities that people can come up with 
that scientists can come up with utilizing these tools. Like I said, the scanning electron microscope has been around for a long time. However, it's being continually improved, and there are uh, there's research that's being done on different detection methods, uh, collection methods, and um, you know making the hardware even better. Right. Well, I, I think you hit on a very key point that when, when I've talked with some of the students at, at the university here and with a lot of people, pe people tend to think that scientists are just boring nerds in a lab or an observatory that don't have any personality, but it takes so much creativity to seek out and discover new things and discover new ways of utilizing even, you know, you talk about technologies we've had since the 30s, yet we're still improving upon it to be able to develop something, you know, as far as artificial retinas and being able to just look what we did today, you know, seeing the compound eye of a fly in that great detail, especially now in a hangout on air, but you, you're being able to be creative and it's not just you have to be good at maths or you have to study hard, but you need to, you know, be able to visualize the science going on and use your creativity to help connect with the universe around you, whether it be in a large scale or a very small scale. And I think you're really uh, representing that really well in this hangout. Well, thanks. I also, um, I do want to mention that there are, uh, so there are two, uh, two schools in the United States that uh, teach electron microscopy. It's a two-year degree for a technician. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is in Madison, Wisconsin, and its uh, previous name was Madison Area Technical College. I believe they've renamed themselves to Madison College. Uh, and the other school is Delta College, which is located in California, and I believe it's Stockton, but I'm okay. not too sure. But if you Google it, if, you know, and if you're interested as in a high school, uh, if a high school kid is interested in, in getting a two-year degree and not going and dealing with you know, high-end characterization materials. I took the two-year course at Madison Area Technical College, and I learned everything, I mean, the technical side of things, learning how to build them, learning how to fix these things, you know, and so there's not only just the high-end characterization of things, there's right. learning how to take care of these things, too. Yeah. And Madison is a cool town, too. So if anyone, <laughs> I love going to Madison. It's, it's a really pretty town to go to. Yeah, because I'm guessing these machines are quite high maintenance. So. Yeah. 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 They're a little fussy. No, oh, a little <laughs> bit fussy. <laughs> now, so, we, we, we had some other samples here, and one that I know I'm extremely excited about. Uh, did you have any other that you prepared on there, or should I switch over to the second you camera? Can go, no, you can switch on over. Awesome. So I'm extremely excited about this. And I think I have it actually as a live image. So I may, uh, it looks okay to me. Wow. So what are so we looking at, what you're looking yeah. at? So what you're looking at there is uh, the Allende meteorite that crashed in 1969 in Chihuahua, Mexico. It's probably the most studied uh, piece of outer space that has ever been studied. Uh, and if you click on it and see it in full screen, oh boy, it went out of focus very badly. Uh, okay, there in the middle there is a crosshair. Right. Uh, and so if I can direct your attention to the lighter contrast area, the light, the bright stuff, uh, those are, are, are cal calcium particles. Okay. And right directly south of that crosshair are two big round circles. Uh, though, though that's aluminum. And these are what's called uh, calcium aluminum inclusions. And they are the oldest uh, elements that we have been able to characterize. Basically, it defines T. Uh, t equals zero. Time is zero, and right. it's about 4.5 billion years old right there. Uh, so the, you see those two particles directly south of the crosshair? Those mm -hmm. are the aluminum particles, and those are inclusions of the meteorite. And the light particles around that are, are the calcium. Wow. And if you, if you 
sometimes they've melted together and have formed the uh, a, a calcium aluminum and No, oh, do we lose John? At about one o'clock, oh, you, can, you can see. You can tell by the different contrasts. So if you if you train your eye to look for the bright stuff, that's calcium. Okay. If you look at the aluminum, uh, something in between is the the calcium aluminum. But that's the oldest the oldest uh, stuff that we we have on on Earth that we've studied. That's that's amazing, and and gives some reasoning on why it's the oldest stuff. This is what what formed during the accretion, and when when our star was formed, and then the the planetary bodies formed, like like Earth and Venus and Mars. And so there's stuff floating out, and this is meteorite from space that came down and, and landed on Earth. So since Earth is so geologically active, it's being recycled all the time. So there's very very few old. Um, pieces of Earth that we're able to study that's on the surface of the Earth that's spanned for billions of years. So to find these really old materials, they literally have to be raining down from space onto us and we can collect it and be able to study what's what happened, what was the material like when our Earth formed. Yeah. You know a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> I just, I just want to give Credit due. I have to. I have to thank a colleague of mine, Dr. Philip Heck, from the Field Museum of Natural History in, uh, in Chicago here, for lending me this sample. Uh, he's curator of meteorites uh, at the Field Museum. So thanks. Oh yeah, thank. You. That's this is amazing. I we're, you know, we're looking at one of the oldest things, if not the oldest things, humans have ever been able to study directly right here in this hangout. This is phenomenal stuff. So when the Earth was forming, this is how old this is. It hasn't been recycled through any sort of active geology. Um, it's yeah. through tectonics or anything like this. It's been in space the same amount of time that that the matter that makes up our, our planet is. At yes, and, and actually within, within this sample here um, are even older uh, things. There's pre-solar diamond grains in here and it, it goes beyond the resolution of a, of a scanning electron microscope to see these things because uh, they're on the order of um, a few hundred angstroms so oh, wow. we, we would have to take it for a different hangout to a, to a transmission electron microscope that has you know one and a half angstrom resolution to see these but the, they're believe me they're there they're, they're just very 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 small and they're they're even older than the 4.5 billion year old uh, right. calcium aluminum inclusions. So this, it's a pretty cool sample. This is a really is a really cool sample. I yeah. Just Jerry. thinking about yeah, just <laughs> yeah, thinking about the scale of this. It's hard to see the crosshair. It's a funky green color, but the problem I have with I, I can't uh, be at two microscopes at the same time. So we're actually. Uh, remotely pulling in the feed from the microscope from a different lab. So I have to apologize for that. So I, I'm pointing my mouse cursor right here on the on the center of the crosshair. Yeah. We're not and usually you, this speechless, but yeah. <laughs> Scott, could you point to the aluminum for, for our viewers? All right. Exactly. Right there, there's two. That's the aluminum. The bright areas are calcium. So the brighter albedo right here. Yeah. Right. And What's the really bright stuff? The really, really bright stuff. Uh, it's it's um, it's calcium as well. Uh, okay. It's just it's it, that is what happened. Calcium is an insulator, so that's why this sample is in this microscope because this is an environmental microscope. Okay. And I've had this thing running uh, without being over in the lab to take care of it and. It just needs some adjusting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is just. Yeah. I, I am blown away. I just trying to think on, and one thing I, I I tell people a lot as far as with astronomy, which is what I I think about, just being able to think on scales that we're not typically used to thinking on, when either when we're talking about sizes as far as astronomical units or light years, but when we're also thinking about time. 
and when when we're talking about billions of years and how you know our sun you know, our star formed and the, the the planets formed with it through the same accretion disk you know, a little under 5 billion years ago and this is around mm -hmm. the third of the age of the universe so we're we're able to literally look at something formed at the same time that our star was forming you know it's just a little yeah. bit after that this is just and you're, when you're talking about the, with the dust coming on, we're talking about things that happened in the furnace of a star that exploded even further back is when this material was created through nucleosynthesis. And this, yeah, this it's just a great just like visualiz vi uh, excuse me visualization of the evolution of of matter through you know over billions of years and how things are being formed in the furnace of a star going through the lifetime of a star to be able to create new stellar systems and new solar systems like the one that we live in now yeah i like the irony of looking at this thing too because you know it you, you <laughs> think it's astronomical things and that's telescopes and things like that and here right. we're looking at little bitty things that came from you know four and a half billion years ago. I mean, it's hard to comprehend yeah. this kind of stuff. Right. It, 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 we just had um, earlier today with, um, with Allison, we had an astrobiology uh, hangout. But this is, you know, and it ties into, this is alien in origin. This is not from the Earth. This, is, this comes from space. Yeah, I mean, space. I was afraid to look at the sample. I, I didn't know what, what uh, fish people were going to pop out. <laughs> <laughs> It, yes, uh, we'll, we'll link to that as well because fish people something brought up um, quite a bit in the in the hangout beforehand. But yeah. it's it this has been absolutely great, John. Um, I, I'm going to go over real quick in in the comments because I know there have been a lot of comments very similar to how we're feeling. We're just blown away. Yeah. Um, and, and see if we have anything else here. I know we've gone a little bit over, and I think everyone's okay with the fact that we've gone yeah. a little bit over. But let me take a quick look at all of our comments. All Everybody's right. watching NCAA basketball. No, they're not. <laughs> All the cool people are watching us. So. <laughs> uh, yes, you know, Tom uh, said billions of years in an angstrom. I mean, we're we're thinking about scales here. I mean, we're talking about billions of years old, but the tiniest scales that we can measure is this yeah. just phenomenal. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Jonathan Langdell said this might actually be the coolest hangout on Google so far. I would have to agree. This is. I would have to agree with that. We're, uh, me and Scott, we're not usually this speechless, but there was a lot of jaw dropping, <laughs> don't know what to say moments. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Glad everybody enjoyed it. And, and we will definitely have to have you back too, because I know that we have some yeah. other ideas um, with you and some colleagues and things that we yes. can do in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So we we just to let. We have a, a one-of-a-kind transmission electron microscope housed in our facility here. And just to give you a little primer of it, uh, it has 0.5 angstrom resolution, half of an angstrom. Wow. And uh, <laughs> I didn't want to show any images of it because I want you to wait and... <laughs> You oh, said it, it, yeah. <laughs> it, it, here's the teaser. Join yeah. us next yeah. time. Us this time. is the season finale, the cliffhanger ending. Because <laughs> I remember one of the things I asked you if we could do. This was before I realized that you couldn't um, do biologics with a scanning one. Um, was to look at a virus because I think that would be amazing. Is that something you think we could do at a future date? To look. I'm sorry, but we need to look at what. To look at a virus, is that the virus? Possible? Yes, the virus, the virus. Okay. That that will be for the the trans the TEM. Yeah. The next yeah. the next one. Um, okay. We may need to uh, talk about how to get a sample. Yeah. Uh, because viruses are are uh, smaller than what we can resolve in these microscopes. That yeah. takes it to uh, the transmission mode. Okay. But I'm 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 up for it. I'm up um, I, yeah. I remember when I first I, I did way back when some when I was doing the, the, the wildlife stuff we were looking at viruses okay and they're very small I mean, they're yeah. small little particles little yeah. bugs. Just little, <laughs> little bugs. like things 
Um, going back to the comments here, Chad Haney asks, um, how much do you collaborate with local universities? Um, example being the University of Chicago, you mentioned Northwestern University as well. Is there a lot of collaboration that your lab does with other universities? Yes, so uh, collaboration work is 75% is, um, of my work. Nice. Um, I work uh, at a national user facility here. We are the Electron Microscopy Center at Argonne, and uh, we have users and collaborators from all over the world. So we work with people from the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, Northwestern, UW-Madison. I, I, if I put a peg in a U.S. map, I could probably fill every state a few times with the universities that we work with and collaborate with people. That's so awesome. And yeah. There are people from all over the world. So um, uh, we, we run through a proposal system. So when we open up for proposals, uh, we accept proposals, and we have an external peer-reviewed proposal committee, and they look at the science. Okay. And if if it's and it's ranked, and if the the science is at a high level, uh, we accept the proposal, and you collaborate and work with us uh, to get your science done. And uh, everything is peer reviewed, so it's fair. And uh, you know, the other twenty five percent is our own research. Uh, right. So we basically facilitate facilitate as a facility. Uh, and, and maintain these high-end pieces of equipment that have been modified uh, that universities cannot afford. Right. Uh, we yeah. don't do any proprietary work. Uh, it, everything has to be published in a, in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, if, you, if there was some industry out there that was interested in proprietary work, we usually push you to a private organization to, to get the work done. Right. That's, that's so yeah, really cool. we do a lot of collaboration work. Um, Jonathan Langdale asks here, is there a best microscope in the world? Is there a special one that's all isolated that can go to the, like, the tiniest level? Is that there at Argonne? Is it somewhere else globally? <clears throat> well, uh, are you biased? Like, oh, mine's the best? <laughs> you know, there, there, there is no Christmas tree of microscopes. They're all... Um, they're all specially designed to do one thing really well. Right. Um, and I know for a fact that they're not located in one institution. They're scattered around the world. So to answer the question, I would have to know what result you want first. You know, if you want elemental mapping uh, in, a, in, a, in a transmission microscope, or if you want high-resolution imaging, uh, there's a microscope at, uh, at, at Berkeley okay. uh, that, com that is in unison with ours. It also has a half angstrom resolution, okay. but it's geared for doing something different than what ours does. So it's really down to what, you know, what science you're trying to do to find the best detector for... Exactly. There is no super duper microscope that you buy off the shelf that does everything better than anything else. Right. It's, it's, it depends upon what you want to do with the microscope. Very good. Well, yeah, I, I'm seeing a, there's been a few questions that's already been asked um, throughout here. I'm seeing a, a few requests for maybe next time, so we might collect uh, some requests and see if you'll be able to um, accommodate s some other imaging for our, our next big hangout. Sure. But yeah, we're we're about twenty minutes longer than we expected. I'm totally fine with it. And, I'm not uh, complaining. <laughs> <laughs> but John, thank you, thank you so yeah. much for uh, for coming, hanging out with us, showing us this tiny, tiny world, and you know, You're especially you know the scales. I mean, whether we're looking at a, a fly or the filament of a of a light bulb or the oldest thing that humans have yeah. been able to detect directly here on Earth. This, this is just been wonderful. I, I'm personally very well, thank thankful. Thank you again for with yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you've been amazing at explaining it in a way that me, who's never worked with electron microscopes, can understand. You translated your work really well. And yes. thank you so much for doing this with us. Well, thank you. I look forward to next time.
All right. Well, um, later this evening, and oh, let's see what time is it. Four th so probably around three hours from now, um, we'll be having the virtual star party here on Google Plus as well. Um, I believe since Fraser's out of town, I will be hosting that, and we will be connecting telescopes to a Google Plus Hangout. So we'll be going in the opposite direction, looking mm -hmm. out far into space and resolving very large things instead of very tiny things. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm Scott. I'm with KnowTheCosmos.com, also uh, part of CosmoQuest, doing education and public outreach. My co-host, Bedini. Um, I represent Science Sunday. And we've been doing all these science um, hangouts on Sunday. And it's been amazing. And next week, we're doing one on the ENCODE sequencing project um, with Rajni, Scott, myself, and two other genome scientists, Josh and Ian. So same time, same Science Sunday channel. So <laughs> everyone can tune in for that. Awesome. Um, All right. Yeah. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Um, Bye.